With those as the ground rules, let me introduce our panel. First of all, Joe Castiglione. Uh, Joe is the athletic director at the University of Oklahoma, and he served in that position since 1998. And Joe and I know each other on, on a different context. In the circles that I run in and the panels that I sometimes facilitate, Joe is known as a real leader, a real voice of mentoring and encouragement to the entire industry. So we're thrilled to have Joe Castiglione on, on this call and this webinar today. Sean Frazier, who I'm going to throw it to here in just a moment to kind of open us up, but Sean has served at the, as the athletic director in Northern Illinois since 2013. He's a former student athlete on the Crimson Tide football team. And we're thrilled to have you with us as well, Sean. So again, get ready for your comments here to open us up in just a moment. Keith Gill is on. Keith was named commissioner of the Sunbelt Conference last year and previously served as the athletic director at the University of Richmond and American University. He's a former student athlete from Duke University. Keith, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for participating. Uh, Dr. Chris Howard. Chris is the eighth president of Robert Morris University near Pittsburgh. He's a graduate, uh, former student athlete of the United States Air Force Academy. Spent a little time at Oxford as a student. Very prestigious and esteemed career. Chris, what a thrill to have you. Thank you for being here. And Dr. China Jude, China and I were visiting. She's in the lovely city of Laramie, Wyoming. And there she serves as a senior associate athletic director at the University of Wyoming. She's also been a real leader in some industry circles. She's led the uh, Minority Opportunities for Athletics Association. She's the founder of the Women of Color Athletic Directors Network. She's also a former student athlete. And so, China, thank you for being here. We'll talk more about uh, the Vida Vu Rock and, and other yes. things. <laughs> I also want to get to Coach Mel Tucker. Uh, you, you know him because he's already an internet and social media superstar. He, he does this you know, in his free time as a hobby. He has an incredible platform. Mel has coached all over the industry in both uh, collegiate and professional sports, but he's currently the head football coach at Michigan State. And he came to that position after a time at Colorado and a long list of other esteemed positions. He too is a former student athlete having played for the Wisconsin Badgers. So that's our panel. And I want to just ask Sean, you, you were instrumental with ADU in setting this up. And I'm just going to be the Ron Burgundy on the, on the call in the panel today, trying to facilitate some interaction and conversation. But would you mind just setting the tone and the thesis for what we're here to do today? Yeah, no question, John. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us. Um, I'm humbled to be with my colleagues today and our panelists. Uh, a wealth of experience, a wealth of knowledge, um, and as we know, the, the, the issues that have happened with George Floyd have kicked off so many different emotions, so many different issues um, that we're dealing with right now, current issues on our campus and, our, and, and as well as in our communities. Obviously, uh, race, racism, uh, racial issues are complex conversations uh, to have in America and quite frankly in the world. Uh, we find ourselves right now in a significant significant crossroads uh, where we need demonstrated leadership to deal with these issues. Black and brown folks, all, all people are reeling by what's happening. This is not a conversation that has just happened. We are dealing with these issues on a daily basis. Many of our cities, our communities have burned or are burning. We're having lots of emotional reaction to the human rights issues that have sparked significant change in our communities. So when we talked about this particular panel, we talked about putting best practices, we talked about a culture, we talked about a consciousness about what's happening across the board. A human rights issue, issues obviously that are facing specifically black and brown people, but all minorities, all protected classes. And I think it's time for us to come together as thought leaders, as practitioners who are on the front line to talk about this, because this is not going away. This is just not a passing situation. This is a time for us to reflect, 
empower, and quite frankly, educate and create the shared agenda that's necessary to protect all of our people, not just one particular group. So as we kind of go through this conversation, and John put a great bow on that, is that this is a time to talk about that and be very candid in a safe space, right? So we can have this level of discourse that quite frankly will be a, a part of it, the toolbox that you will have to go back to your campuses and to continue this conversation with follow-up and measurable goals. So I'll hold it there, because as you know, I can talk. <laughs> I will just say this. I'm excited about this conversation and thankful that ADU, Jason Belzer, John, our panelists have stepped up to create this conversation that will be ongoing so we can move us in the next direction. So thanks, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, panelists, for being here. And I'm truly excited to be a part of this process. John, that was beautiful. It really set the tone for us. And uh, I appreciate your passion coming through the screen. And I would just ask the other panelists, uh, I would like you to interject your emotion. I would like you to interject your honesty. Uh, it's my job to watch our clock. It's my job to uh, steer if I need to but please feel free to make this an engaging dialogue. Sean, I, I want to confess something about myself. I, the older I get, the more I read, the less I feel uh, inclined to be any sort of authority. What I feel like I need to do most of all, given how I grew up, is to do a lot more listening. So in the spirit of that, uh, I get to ask some questions in order to engage the audience to listen. So again, if you're in the audience, what I want to encourage you to use is that chat feature within our webinar. Open that chat feature up, submit your questions, make sure that when you do that, you identify yourself, your name, your school, your organization, and your title. That would be helpful for us. And Jason and his folks at ADU will help us gather those questions because here in just a moment, I'm going to run out of questions. So for those of you who are going to join us as panelists, uh, Joe, Chris, Keith, China, Mel, Sean, I would like to ask each of you, as I throw you a question, take about five or seven moments to, uh, minutes to ask that, uh, answer that question, and then that'll let us guide and, and flow into the next conversation. But I in no way want to do anything but let the conversation build. And most importantly, I want to offer a guarantee to the audience, and that is I want the audience to walk away with practical applications, with specific strategies, and Sean, as you said, with action, not just talk, we, you know, we'll, we'll discuss it here, but with things that they can put into action. So with that said, um, we've got about 200 folks with us this morning. So I'm feeling nervous already. I, I hope I don't screw this up, but we've got 178 folks on the line. So the first question is for Joe, Sean, and China. Okay, Joe, Sean, and China. Over the course of your career as leaders in college athletics, what are some of the practices that you've had? What are some of the programs that you engage to promote conversations with student athletes around the issues of race, diversity, and minority status? From your experiences, are there approaches that are largely ineffective? You know, have you tried some things that didn't work when it comes to these type of conversations? So first, what are you doing? What's effective? Secondly, what have you found that's ineffective? So if you don't mind, uh, China, let's go to you. Sure. Well, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my experiences. And uh, thank you for creating this space, uh, Sean and John and, and Jason. Uh, I want to first uh, tap into what my role is for MOA, what is MOA. I think that that's very important first. Uh, the mission of MOA is to provide opportunities to exchange ideas advocate increased participation and administrative opportunities for minority and athletics. We are 800 members strong, representing all three NCAA divisions, NAIA, junior college, and some uh, athletic-related associations. Uh, we want to continue to, to engage in many of discussions in regards to all aspects of our student athletes, coaches, and staff. Now, um, MOA has been in existence for 20 years. 
so uh, it's unfortunate that we are in the position right now for this devastating um, death of George Floyd to happen. Uh, this has been happening for a long time. It's, it's interesting how the, shot uh, the spotlight is shined now, but we are here. Um, I definitely am hopeful for those departments and universities who have already been having discussions way before this particular time. And even at University of Wyoming, we have uh, been in, involved and engaged in uh, many things to get our students and our student athletes to be involved. Uh, I'll start with the current climate and just work a little bit back. Uh, I arrived here at University of Wyoming in, in 2018. I'm really fortunate that Tom uh, Berman, our athletic director, was a visionary and wanted to make sure that he was getting different voices on his senior staff. And um, it's just been a, a great experience here. We have, uh, we're, we're planning in a social justice town uh, hall. And um, this social justice town hall is um, a, a, something that's very important for our student athletes to be able to have conversations, very difficult conversations, in regards to this and many other issues. We wanna create that space. Uh, prior to the, and, and hopefully that will be happening next week, now that our, our many of our student athletes on the football team is uh, finishing their quarantine phase, we wanna create that uh, safe space for them. Uh, throughout the academic year, which also included last academic year, we created um, a, a program called Many Stories Matter. Initially, this was uh, created by one of our international students, uh, women's basketball players, who wanted to create a non-judgmental space for student athletes to talk about a variety of issues, whether it's uh, stereotypes, uh, respect, um, uh, coming together as one to, um, to talk about the student athlete experience. The most recent Mini Stories Matter section or session we had was facilitated by a football player talking about the Kobe Bryant death and the incidents that occurred with Kobe Bryant and how the media was involved in that process in, in the interview with Lisa Leslie. Um, so, we have town halls, mini story matter, and then we also incorporate a number of other programs to make sure that the student athletes are getting the education. We had uh, our 1987 um, Heisman Trophy runner up, Don McPherson, come in to talk about the blind spot of uh, masculinity. And, and within that, court, um, that presentation, he incorporated being a black male student athlete and with some of those pressures that he's experienced. But I, I really want to focus on something that, that makes a significant difference when supporting our student athletes. Nothing matters unless you have the support and the backing of administration and coaches, and they need the education also. Uh, it's, it's uh, interesting how it's set up here at Wyoming. I oversee the coaching and administration professional development and my colleague, um, Taylor Stemke, oversees the student athlete professional development. So we're gonna have to work in parallel uh, uh, strategies to make sure that if we're creating these spaces for these student athletes to be involved and engaged in, in receiving this information, we need to tap into coaches and staff and also tap into uncomfortabilities, vulnerabilities, and whatever talking points or strategies that they need to incorporate in many of their team meetings or uh, practice plans or just how to motivate our student athletes. So uh, I'll stop there, but uh, there's so much more that I wanna share in regards to strategies moving forward, but I'll uh, yield to the rest of the, the panel. Well, as, as we said, when we were uh, getting to know each other for this panel, I so appreciate the leadership you provided. That hasn't happened overnight. It's been a commitment that you've made, and I, I'm, I'm really grateful for what, you, what you're what you doing as a leader, as an individual to create change. So, Sean, I want to go to you and Joe now, and the question is, again, just 
as a leader within collegiate athletics, what are some of those practices that you're doing, some that are working to promote these kinds of conversations, and some that you might find ineffective when it comes to, again, focusing conversations around issues of race, diversity, and minority status? Sean, we'll go to you. Uh, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Yes, um, interesting. Uh, for us, it's been a cultural component. Um, what's worked, the, what's been most effective is that diversity and inclusion, issues of race, uh, racial discourse, uh, protected class conversation um, is, is pervasive throughout the organization. And I think for, for us, it's about living through the issues, the, you know, the sport being the microcosm of society. I think we can... I think we can say that, and Dr. Harry Edwards said it the best in his the theoretical framework. But for us in athletics, it needs to be about that. Because if we have this melting pot of different folks that come into our athletic department, that, that make up our campus community, uh, it's important to, to see them and to understand them and to embrace them. So for us, it starts job one. We do have a group called the Diversity Integration Group. I, had this group as, a, as an athletic director throughout my tenure, uh, created at first at the University of Wisconsin. Um, we, 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 uh, we fashioned this group to make sure that we're reflective, that we understand what's going on. Um, I'm not a 19 to 21 year old, so culturally uh, I'm an African American, but I have years on me relative to knowing those years and what they were. So there's a component of understanding and not being tone deaf about the plight of young people, uh, younger than I. So this diversity integration group is reflective of faculty, student, staff, and a cross-section, not just in the athletic department, but external, both in the community as well as uh, on campus. So that group meets regularly, and it has subgroups in it, to deal with programming, to deal with the curriculum, to deal with how students are dealing with different issues, case in point, the uh, George Floyd issue, okay? So we have to pivot and make sure that our plan and the things that we are doing in the strategic intentional process is incorporated on that. But it's not tearing it all down and all of a sudden we have to do something, it's a modification. And I think that's very important that you have things in place that create safe spaces. And it's also too, to make sure that, that connectability to campus and the community that you have that relationship that you don't have to kind of re-engage that or, or create that when you have a crisis, okay? It needs to be a, a natural, authentic way of doing business. So go back to my culture component, creating those conversations, much easier, okay? You say you don't have that already created, okay? Well, you need to start. That is the part of the demonstrating leadership where you're having these conversations and we're talking about and they're, and they're complex. I don't want to marginalize that this is not tough conversation. It is. But it's very important that folks see that there's an inviting top-down, bottom-up, side-to-side approach to understanding these issues. Very important. Even if I was a, wasn't a person of color, this needs to happen. It's a cultural thing. And I think it's very important that we, that, 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 that process move forward. I'm sorry, John, did you have a question? Joe, I'm hearing from Sean and from China, this, this need for it to be built into the culture, for it to be supported and endorsed by the administration. Um, you're someone who's known and admired for the way that you create a strategy, you create a culture, you, you have an incredible vision statement that you cast at Oklahoma. Share with those that are listening in, watching this webinar, some of the practical things that you've seen work in your organization, some of the things that maybe you've tried that haven't worked. Do you mind sharing some of those, Joe? Yeah, um, I uh, appreciate everything that's been said to this point. I uh, can relate. Uh, what Sean was saying, uh, what China said, uh, you know, I want to say thank you for allowing me to be part of this. And, you know, for those of the people who have joined us and those that you serve on your campuses, I know this is a, a very challenging time. Um, like everybody on this panel, we've been 
engaged with our student athletes and engaged with our staff. I think, you know, in cases like we're talking about, even though the focus right now is on student athletes, it's important to recognize that our own staff, many of our staff members are also struggling right now. And um, so as much as we're having programming for our student athletes, we have to have programming for staff as well. But the, the, um, the discussions, the conversations that are taking place have to lead to action. And uh, if I've heard one thing um, lately, and I've heard it many times through the years, that uh, people say, well, I don't really know where to start. Well, that cannot be a reason not to start. And uh, as I said um, earlier, there, there are just so many ways that you can take a step forward. The conversations that we've had on campus over the many years, I, actually at two universities where I've worked especially, um, have all been helpful. Um, but I don't know that they've always been as robust as they need to be. And during those times, I would say, and I'm just being totally honest here, I would say that we had a sense that we were accomplishing something. Um, you know, we could point to uh, what took place in those conversations, ideas that evolved, what um, our student athletes would like to see, what our coaches would like to see. Some of it, you know, involved our own department, um, programming to um, development of safe spaces, uh, to professional development opportunities, um, being completely transparent, improving our hiring practices. And then, you know, once we get our own house in order, how we can work across campus and our community and beyond. And, um, you know, we've had a few situations on our own campus here where um, the conversations that we had prior to those situations developed, I think might have helped to some degree but once um, we had a couple of examples of uh, racism develop within our community, it was as uh, shocking as it was, um, I think, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, a, a moment you know, to help us move forward. Today, now, what we're talking about, I don't think is a moment. Like Sean said at the beginning, I think this is a movement. And um, it is the... Perhaps, you know, the turning point, um, and hopefully that it is, you know, to beginning to take these actionable steps. Um, I think about programs we've had. You know, we had uh, conversations that evolved from Student Athlete Advisory Council. We developed subgroups. Um, we called ours bridge builders at one time, um, and that, you know, evolved to uh, our student athletes of color. And then it expanded um, to try and, and address a lot of other um, shortcomings that we had both you know, in our department, on our campus, and in our, our uh, world of intercollegiate athletics. And then that's evolved even more. Um, we have um, weekly conversations throughout the entire semester. And of course, they've even continued uh, when we all had to uh, move away from our campus activities and go online and be at home. We even continued those conversations of men of color and women of color. And they aren't just for men of color and women of color. They're for everybody. Um, like uh, we see, even, uh, even the attendance at those uh, meetings that we have each week sort of rise and fall depending on the time of year, availability, uh, maybe the, the passion that might be driven by something going on in the world. Um, but we have to continue to be intentional about keeping them going. As was said earlier, this is a time where our student athletes are going to want to, to see action. Um, we've created the safe spaces internally. I've learned a lot. I've, again, I'll say I, I thought we were more progressive than, than we really are. And uh, the, the deeper we dive, the more we learn and um, making the commitment to put the resources there. I would also like to um, uh, underscore, I think what China said, that um, many of our student athletes know their coaches care and they see it manifest themselves in a lot of ways, but they wanna see their coaches 
be more involved in these programs so they can learn, so they can understand, so they can help um, help them. We uh, we had a moment here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it it um, you know really uh, you know, caused us to to look inside and try to figure out what what we could do. And um, rather than try to you know create some kind of bureaucratic approach to it, um, the empowerment of our staff and our student athletes led to a program that we co-sponsored with Kansas State University. And that was uh, Humanity Talks. And uh, it was a program, literally, we put together in less than a week, um, thinking that it would involve the student athletes uh, of both universities primarily and or uh, as we expand it to the conference. But through a couple more conversations with our student athletes, they were open to have administrators or coaches participate with them but in a listening mode, because that was uh, their time, their space. They wanted to be vulnerable. Um, they wanted to have the raw conversation. And uh, they, were, they were kind enough to let a lot of us join in. What we thought might draw, I don't know, 60 or 100 people for a, a virtual conversation um, ended up having well over 800 people from around the United States and uh, beyond, because as you know, some of our student athletes are living at home in other countries right now. Um, but we had student athletes at um, many of the universities that are represented on this call today, I'm sure, uh, all levels of division one, two, and three junior college um, coaches and administrators were in the uh, uh, position to be listening, not talking. And we learned a great deal. Um, from our student athletes. And I would tell you uh, as I wrap up my comment that uh, there are some big ideas you know, that came from that and I think we can work on those. But the one thing that I learned more than anything is just the humanity of this you know, whole opportunity. Just trying to take moments to learn more about each other. Think about the shoes that they are in. Think about the position that they are in. Listen to them. Um, if we haven't had these conversations on our campus, um, we're already behind the eight ball now, that's for sure. And uh, it needs to happen right away. But I think in uh, uh, going forward, those conversations have to continue to happen and they're going to get more difficult. And we have to be comfortable, as was said earlier, being uncomfortable and um, be able to take what we hear in those conversations and make it actionable. Joe, thank you for that. I, I want to turn from, from that opening question and, and Chris, I want to invite you and Keith particularly in on this next question. So we're hearing from these panelists this, this idea that uh, these kinds of conversations need to be a part of culture. They need to be ongoing. Joe was extraordinarily transparent and speaking about some of the shortcomings that he had experienced, some of the things that, that he wished that he had done earlier or better. And I think to Sean's point, and Joe's underscored it, China's highlighted, th this is a moment. Uh, and it's a moment where uh, things need to happen. And so uh, to you, Keith, and to you, Chris, the question I ask of you is, should athletic departments be spearheading these conversations? with student athletes or does the university have an obligation to have a unified message across the entire student body? What are the best practices that each of you have seen? One is a university uh, executive administrator, president, chancellor, and then the other as a, a leader within a commission, within a, a particular conference. What are the best practices that you, that you have seen uh, undertaken as it relates to these efforts? I'm a, I'm a new commissioner, and um, one thing that I've learned is always defer to the presidents. So I will defer to Dr. Howard, uh, my good friend, who I appreciate sharing this question, oh um, and um, to, to go ahead and start. Yeah, so Chris, you're up. Couldn't have been better. Thank you. Thank you for that setup, Keith. And uh, I know it's better half Tiffany, so she's raised them well. 
kid that I've been, <laughs> kid that I've been friends for almost 20 years now with Joe working in Oklahoma. Uh, I want to just celebrate and lift up uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, you all are absolutely terrific. Uh, China, by the way, Tom got his graduate degree. Robert Morris, we're very proud. He's on the college football playoff selection committee. I can say he took the Robert Morris slot when I left. It's pretty powerful. <laughs> um, Sean and Coach Tucker, this uh, thank you for your leadership and what you stand for. So let's start from the beginning and acknowledge at the macro level what's happening, and then I'll drill down to the specifics of your question, John. Um, I like what my friend Joe Castiglione said. It's not a moment, it's a movement. It can be. But the moment, like China said, is connected to other moments. And when black people see what's happening now, they're not just thinking about what happened to George Floyd. They're thinking about what happened to Emmett Till in the late 50s. A black young, a black boy, it's what he was, he was 13 years old thereabouts, in Mississippi visiting from China, uh, accused of uh, whistling at a white woman, beaten to death, thrown into a river. His body was so disparaged and so beat up and bloated, and what the, the authorities asked the mother to do a closed casket uh, funeral service in Chicago, but instead they did an open, she, she refused that they did an open casket that galvanized a, guy, a young minister in Birmingham to do a, um, a boycott named Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you continue to fast forward to John Lewis walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on um, Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, um, literally beaten on his head and about his head and shoulders by Alabama State Troopers. When I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1992, 1991, excuse me, a year later, the Rodney King beatings occurred. Um, fast forward to 19, excuse me, to 2020, we see a black man, um, much like the folks on this uh, pitch uh, on the screen here today, basically murdered on, on, on television. So I like that John and, and Joe and other people talk about this is a human rights question. Um, it's a human rights question in America that's informed by our original set of 401 years of structural racism. Um, the fact that I can say that before you as a university president, as an African-American running a predominantly white institution and not have to caveat, not like the, not like the, not have to backpedal like the Deion Sanders or anything like that. I can just say it. I can call it what it is. And that's what presidents, that's what I found as a best practice, John and Keith, I know you'll pick up on this. The number one thing that the leader can do is call it what it is. We had a, a, a tough instance, uh, a racial incident when I was in my previous institution, a D3 school as president. And the first thing I did was write an email and I said, this is bad and this is why. And if you were involved, you were wrong. And if you stood around and watched, you were wrong as well. And as soon as I hit the send button, I knew all hell was going to break loose. And, um, and, 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 and within about an hour or so, I was called by the governor. We were a private institution called by the governor. It was in the New York Times, the London Times. Uh, all the papers, uh, it, it news, tra news, bad news travel very quickly. But that's what presidents do. They need to step up and call the moment what it is. Now, in terms of what should happen, I think we're in an ampersand world. And what I mean by that, we, we need students. And I talked to my AD, Chris King, and I commend him and Coach Tool on our basketball team, Coach Clark on our football team, to, uh, Coach Bruce Goggley on our, on our women's basketball team, Coach Tool on the men's basketball team, stepping up and stepping in the moment and listening, as Joe said, to student athletes and try to be a part of the conversation out front. I made my statement. They, they started mobilizing, much like you all are doing on the screen. But what's interesting, I say ampersand, they have to do that. And I have to own the moment with the board. And my administration has to do things through student life. Our faculty really stepped up with some great resources. So and 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 and. And I'll close my comments here. Um, the thing about an athletic program and athletic teams is that if Dr. King talks about beloved communities, you already have a beloved community inside a larger beloved community, right? You already have a team. You have teams. You have teams of teams. So in some ways, I won't say it's easier. It's just more natural for people that have what I call vicarious, transcendent, crucible experiences. That means you do tough things together over and over again. So you learn to not always, and I speak to teams, I say, you don't, your players don't always like each other, but if they want to win, they got to love each other, right? And so there's love in the athletic community. It's a little bit different than the student body at large quite often. So it gives you an opportunity to have a more difficult conversation, even Joe with 800 people, but they're all rowing, as you know, our coach would say, we're all rowing the boat, trying to row the boat in the right direction. So yeah, again, ampersand solution. The president has to own the moment. 
And then from there, it cascades. But there's a unique role for athletics to model how we behave, react, and respect, and live in a community and deal with tough issues. Keith, you've been a, an administrator yourself within athletics. Uh, but now, as a commissioner, tell us some of those best practices that you're seeing or he hearing about. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do want to, um, one, thank you for being here and certainly want to um, recognize the distinguished panelists. Um, I, I think Chris um, set it up perfectly in terms of his kind of ampersand discussion that it really does have to be both. And athletic departments and universities have to operate in sync. Um, this is all higher education and we're connected. However, I do think there is an, a more of an intimate relationship that um, the athletic department has with their student athletes that brings a responsibility to reinforce those messages that the university are putting forth in this regard and also to provide some education and context. And, and so the first you know, best practice that I would, I would say is um, to Chris's point, you know, you've got to be authentic. You've got to, and you've got to just be willing to talk about the moment. I, I think one of the things that I think is so great about kind of this time that makes it feel a little different than maybe some of the other um, times this has happened, because as all every panelist said, this isn't this isn't new in the black community. I don't think anybody is surprised that um, you know a black man died by police brutality. I certainly not. Um, and that's that's unfortunate that that's not surprising to me. However, I have been surprised and, and actually moved um, by the reaction and by the fact that that reaction is a diverse multicultural reaction. When you look at the um, protests, when you have people coming out and speaking in support. And um, and so those conversations are infinitely important. I think coaches play a huge role in that. I think we as athletic administrators play a large role in that as well, trying to create that safe space to have those real um, conversations because I, I think they really matter. I think also trying to give the space to actually have some action. So at the Sun Belt, when we were trying to think about what our response was going to be, it was really important that any kind of statement that we made had a call to action to it. You know, and our call to action kind of had three pillars. Um, when we released it, the first one was education. And I think education is really important in terms of just making sure that people understand the context. So I heard someone the other day, you know, when they were talking about kind of systemic racism, say, hey, we're not fighting, you know, Thomas Jefferson, you know, we're fighting things right now. And I was like, well, that's certainly one way to look at it. But I don't know if that's true. You know, the vestiges of you know, slavery, I mean, if you look at slavery and, and look at impact um, on black people, you would say, well, no, we, we, the, the, the original sins that happened in the 1600s and really long before that, if you think about the British and kind of some of those things, but if you think about just purely American in the 1600s, then you have slavery. And, and part of that is you really have to dehumanize a whole race of people in order to feel comfortable keeping them as slaves. So you have that kind of socialization that is built into the framework for hundreds of years. And then you're released, you know, then, you know, freedom, reconstruction, you're kind of fighting and battling out. 1896, the Supreme Court says, you know what? 14th Amendment doesn't apply to you. Equal protection doesn't apply to you. Separate but equal is fine. So then that is woven into the fabric of society. And then Robert's Board of Education, 1954, overturns that, but nothing really happens, you know, and then that gets you kind of the what, Dr. Howard was talking about Emmett Till, civil rights movement. You start to get some movement in the 60s. You get the civil rights bill passed, but you still don't have that much movement in that regard. And then you start getting some movement and then things start to progress. But now you have, you know, 60 years of history trying to overcome 350 years of history. And so that, and that's just one little small element of systemic racism. And that really, and being able to have that conversation. So I spoke to the football team at Coastal Carolina on Wednesday. And that's one of the things I talked to them about. And, I, and that message to me was for the white players and the black players, which is understand the history of America. You don't have to feel guilty and ashamed and all that kind of stuff because it is not a perfect union. You know, we are working to have a perfect union, but you have to own it in order to take the steps 
so that we can get where we need to be. So I think that education piece is important. And that's something that's going to be an important part of what we're doing in the Sun Belt with our institutions. And they've embraced it. I do think the voter registration piece has been is, is really important. And it's nice to kind of see that take um, shape across the country, because if you are going to affect meaningful change, you need to have the elected officials that have that mindset. And so and I know that the Minneapolis mayor got booed off the stage and, you know, when he didn't say that, you know, he supports defund the police. But the reality is, when is the last time you've seen a black person killed in the manner that they were by the cops and have that a cop arrested so quickly? That really is the mayor putting pressure on the DA because the DA actually said, eh, I don't know that I saw a crime there. And then two days later, he gets arrested. Well, that's the mayor. That's elected officials. That's how elections work. That's why voting matters. That is why voting matters. And all four have been arrested. And I would say in record time, not that it should have been this way over history, but that is our reality. You know, you have people who've been killed in a similar manner and years later, nothing has happened or years later, it might get to a grand jury and nothing is done. And so and that is where elections matter. And so that's why I think the voting registration that, you know, we're going to try to spearhead in the Sun Belt really matters. And then the last piece is really this kind of community policing, because the, 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 the important thing is this is not about being against policing. Policing is necessary. It's good. In many cases, it's effective. I think people are against bad policing when it's racist, when it dehumanizes people. And when you call 911 or someone does a no knock warrant on your house and they kick your door down and you try to defend yourself, you end up with eight bullets and no one is held accountable in any way. And so I just think that you know, that those three pillars are going to be important for us when I think about best practices. Um, you know, that education piece is key and making sure we understand the history. I think the voter registration piece is key to make sure we get elective officials that can really support um, this movement. And then I think making sure that law enforcement and really the whole community, but certainly people of color have strong relationships so that we can make sure that we have good policing and that we can make sure that those kind of events, if they do happen, they are held accountable, um, you know, according to the law. Mel, my next question is gonna be for you. So if you can get in the, in the ready position for that, that would be great. But, but uh, Jason reminds me, and I, I wanna do a lightning round. So no, no, no lengthy expansion, just really quick, short answer. What have you seen if you haven't contributed yet, or if you have, what have you seen that hasn't worked? What is ineffective? In a phrase, in a word, in a sentence, what doesn't work? The things that I've seen that, that have not worked and will not work is uh, basically a non-response and silence. Yeah. That's not going to work. You know, um, waiting for someone else to uh, start the conversation, uh, waiting for the locker room to sort it out on their own uh, and, uh, you know, basically being absent of any type of real leadership uh, on, on the issue, that is absolutely the wrong way to go. Yeah. So before I go to Mel's longer question, Joe, China, Chris, Sean, Keith, anything else that you've seen that doesn't work? Well, real, real quick, um, bring in someone, no offense to consultants, no, no offense to uh, hired gun uh, facilitators. Now that works if you have follow-up and a structure that's going to continue the conversation. Yeah. Uh, bringing someone in, talking about the issues, you know, creating that level of, of discourse, and then you know, coming back to that three years from now, it's not gonna work. And I think ultimately we see a lot of that. Okay, we'll just we'll we'll just have a, a mandatory uh, program, and then uh, we'll hope that this all fixes everything. Yeah. We'll create an environment for that one second or for that one hour, and then y'all can go back to doing what the what you're doing. Yeah, that's not effective. That's not long term. That's not intentional. That's not strategic, and that will not work. That will create things, and it will create, quite frankly, that non-authentic piece that this is more of a hit and miss than a long-term approach. Go, China, Chris, anything you've seen that doesn't work? Yeah, don't set up a committee. Yeah. <laughs> don't create bureaucracy. Jump in, lean in, dive in. And um, 
think about the way that you bring people together. They, they don't want to see, in today's world of social media, they don't want to see some airbrushed statement that you put out on Twitter or Instagram. It's all the logos, looks all great. I stand with you, I'm with you on this and that. And then they're looking at each other saying, when are you standing with me? How are you standing with me? You don't even come to the meeting. You know, so that do not be inauthentic. Yeah. And for me, I do not have all the answers. And I'm, I've got to be vulnerable to say that. Um, mm -hmm. But I have to also be smart to reach out first mm -hmm. and to open up the safe space mm -hmm. and not be judgmental. I've learned more in the last week about our staff. I could not have ever imagined what they're doing, going through, what they're, how they're dealing with their own families, what they're telling their kids what they're telling their players, what their players are telling them. And, and I tried to think about all the ways over my life where I can be so engaged with everybody. And it's been good. Don't get me wrong. It's been good. But I have to go deeper. Mm. I'm going to jump, jump in in there. Uh, definitely appreciate Coach talking about silence. Silence is deadly. You got you to gotta speak up. Uh, the one and done initiatives. I've worked in uh, prevention and law enforcement for about four years and prevention is something that uh, I've spent a lot of time on. So one and done strategies doesn't work, but I'm gonna add on to say, don't counteract. Meaning uh, if you hear black lives matter, don't counteract by saying all lives matter and all of those type of counteract sentences and strategies and justifications why black and brown people are dying, why the system is the way it is. The counteract just really is dismissive, insulting, offensive, and it does not uh, create an environment to get people to feel that they are in a safe space to engage. And so I, I think of, of five strategies. A, acknowledge the issue, B, speak about your vulnerability, your insecurities, and your lack of knowledge of this, uh, what's happening in this world. See, ask for education mm -hmm. and be open to the education. Mm -hmm. uh, D, no counteracting of statements or, or actions. And then the final one is ask, how can I support you? Mm -hmm. How can I be involved in this? If, if people take a consider, consideration of those five strategies, it could be a great environment to, to learn and grow. Right. Uh, I have two quick things, lightning round, John, just say, uh, you what was said before, but um, that fine line as a leader, especially as a president, to offer a charge and to lead by example and, and put the BHAG or the moonshot, whatever it is, and, and be bold, but also understand that you have to create a shared vision. Not a watered down vision, but a shared vision. So as we are, we're doing our work now, thinking about what happened with George Floyd and how I'm pulling together, I've got some things. I said, the number one thing I want to do is bring as many black people as possible. And we're, like I said, Bedali White Institution, as many black people to Robert Morris University as possible and graduate as many as possible and to have them have the greatest lives as possible. I can say that as a president. How it gets operationalized, how that materializes is a lot of people talking, students, student athletes, faculty, staff, and, and, and sort of us having that shared collective vision. Because that's when people want to get into it. They want to roll their sleeves up as opposed to when it falls in their head from the, you know, from some from the president's office. I also wanted to just uh, uh, lift up what Joe said a second ago, just to say personally, I'm, Joe, I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal something. So Joe called me last week when I was I was driving and um, you know, and just talked to me. It's a friend um, and said, hey, uh, I'm reeling on this, Chris. I can imagine you are, too. I just want to hear what you're thinking. And uh, it was uh, not a lot of Joe talking. It was a lot of Joe listening. And he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to call me and ask that. So I just want to just say that in front of the, the 200 or so people on this Zoom that does Joe and I'll be folks on here. I see a lot of authentic leadership amongst all my panelists here. It's great, Chris. Thank you. And, and Coach Mel, I want to go to you. Uh, uh, Chris said earlier, you talked about the safe space that is created in a team. I love what you said, Chris, about a team doesn't have to like each other, but they have to love each other because of the the, uh, 
the battles that they go through because of the trials they face. And often it can be a very rich environment, but it also, uh, Mel, as you've, you and I've seen, as we've seen it played out in the press, it can also be a little bit of a volatile environment. So my question for you, Mel, is what's the responsibility of a, of a coach in having these types of conversations with student athletes? Right now, we're, we're seeing some coaches only right now take a stand. We're seeing some coaches really stumble. Uh, so famous, high-profile coaches stumble. You know, the media may be feeding around them. But what do you believe from your experience coaching so many different places in the colleges, in the, in the pros, what do you believe is the responsibility of a coach on these issues of racial injustice when it's on the minds of the student-athletes? Yeah, first, John, uh, thanks for moderating. I really appreciate it you invited me here and it's an honor to be be here with this great team of speakers uh, joe sean who i've known since 2012 <laughs> and that'll be a chapter of my book and i'm sure it'll be in yours too as well sean <laughs> china chris and keith thank you so much uh yeah leadership okay first and foremost uh how can you lead if people don't know what you stand for that's first and foremost, where you stand and what you stand for. And so um, for me, I have three professional and, and personal uh, mandates, so to speak, um, that I adhere to. Uh, one, communication, uh, communicate. Two, uh, educate. And three, provide, provide resources. Uh, communication. Uh, we talked, we, I've heard this uh, earlier, uh, listen and learn and have empathy. That was my, you know, word of the week Wednesday was, was, was empathy. I think that's critically important to be able to do that. Um, all parties involved and, um, and do that without judgment. That's important. It's hard to do, but I think it's, 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 it's necessary. A dialogue. You know, one-on-one -on -one or group dialogue with all involved, um, from players, uh, board of trustees, ADs, presidents, local law enforcement, coaches on other, from other head coaches and, and from other teams, trainers. Uh, that open dialogue is is it's a really good starting point, um, and if you can do it. In, in, in a, in a uh, safe and authentic way, I think you can get a lot done. Um, my job as a coach is to provide a safe space for my players to be able to express to me how they feel, exactly how they feel without having to pull punches, without having to hold back, without having a fear of backlash or blowback or feeling uh, like at some point what they've said will be used against them later. That's important. And as a leader, I have to show them how to speak up. But and however, when you when you do speak, you better be educated and informed on the issues. And that leads to education. Um, I call it semantic responsibility. You are responsible for what you say. What comes out of your mouth, you got to own that. Um, so we have to be educated and informed uh, on the issues before we can really uh, articulate our position, or what we want to see done in any in, in any uh, significant way. Um, and with education, we can turn intention into achievement. And that's what everyone's calling for right now. They're calling for achievement. Let's accomplish them. Let's get something done. And third, you know, resources. Um, resources are staff. You know, that, that those are part of resources that we provide to, to our student athletes. You have to have leadership that reflects the constituents. You have to have diversity on your on your staffs, not only on the coaching staff, but as we we've talked about it. it change also happens on the administrative level. What does the diversity look like 
uh, at the uh, senior administrative level uh, in the athletic departments and at the university community as, as a whole. Um, resources. We've, we've talked about you know, bringing in folks from the outside, um, asking, asking for help um, you know, to help paint the picture and, uh, and bring in another voice where you sometimes can, can better capture the, mind, the minds of the people that they're talking to. Um, and uh, someone said this, we're not just talking about players, student athletes, we're also, we're also talking about staff. You know, staff needs to be educated. We need to provide these resources to our staff. Uh, this morning, we had a, a, Zoom, a Zoom team meeting and we brought in uh, Joe Tate. He's a, he's a Spartan. Uh, you know, he was a, a captain here. He uh, got into coaching and then he decided he wanted to serve his country, went into the Navy, became a SEAL, and then uh, subsequently uh, got into politics. Now he's a state representative uh, here in, in Michigan. And we brought him in to, uh, to really, as a resource, to um, help educate our players on the uh, process of government, the structure of government, just the basic blocking and tackling, the fundamentals, the stance and alignment, the things that we take for granted to make sure that, and, and our staff was on the call too, to make sure that we have a foundation on how does this thing work? You know, bringing in guys like that they can relate to our staff and our players and are actually in the fight uh, is huge. Um, also, reaching out and connecting and partnering with, you know, other uh, groups that are experts in this space, you know, Black Lives Matter. So on a, on a call with them last week, uh, RISE, uh, it, an organization that came out of the Richie Cognito uh, fiasco that happened in, in, in Miami uh, years ago, and they're still going. Um, meeting with local police, you know, those were things all done last week immediately. Um, those are, we can, those people are resources for us. And then also uh, building on our website and uh, enhancing our website and not the university website, but the actual football website. Uh, building that out and enhancing it um, so we can and providing resources there that are easily easily accessible and digestible for our players uh, to get information uh, in about debate and, and voting, talk about voter registration, media training, implicit bias and social injustice. Um, those um, are things are, are mandates that. That where I'm laser focused on those things, communication, education, resources. Uh, though that's my those things are that's my responsibility as a leader and as a as a head coach. The second part of the question is is uh, is uh, and I think it's uh, I think I've heard this question asked quite a bit. Why is it now? Why is it now? Because um, this is obviously not the first time this happened. Why is it now that we see coaches? Um, taking a stand, coaches making statements, coaches, you know, voicing their opinion on uh, the matter of George Floyd, George, uh, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Armand Arbery. Uh, why is that happening now when that's been an issue for student athletes and coaches for, for many, many years? And I will say first, um, what, what we saw with George Floyd, um, I don't think there was any, in my mind, there's, there was, there's no uh, other uh, reason. There's not a, maybe there was another story. Maybe we don't have all the facts. Maybe, maybe there was a different angle. Maybe, hey, all three angles that I saw, I saw a man get murdered in the streets by the hands of a cop, a, a police officer. That's what I saw. The knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds while he says that he he pleads that he can't breathe, he can't breathe, and uh, he's calling for his mom as he urinates on himself with two other officers on his torso and on his legs and another officer watching. And the officer that had the knee in the neck is staring into the camera with his hands in his pockets, casually taking this man's life. 
George Floyd. So if you're not compelled at that moment when you see that to speak up, I'm not sure what you when you will be compelled to ever speak up. So I think that what is a reason that alone is a reason that you see uh, people stepping stepping up and speaking out. And it's not just coaches; um, they're speaking out across you know, all all walks of life, uh, all businesses. You see people speaking out. It was that egregious uh, and not in 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 your face. Um, secondly, uh, I think what we've seen in the past. And it, it is a common uh, structure, it's a common practice, it's a common theme with, with teams, with football teams. There's typically one voice, okay, one voice to communicate the message for the team. That could be the head coach, could be the general manager, it could be the owner, the NFL team. There's typically one voice, and that's pretty much who you hear from. And so there's many, many years as an, as an assistant coach and a black assistant coach, when situations like this happen and they do occur every year, typically what happens is that uh, the head coach uh, or the, the, the senior leadership will, 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 will call upon the, the black coaches on the staff to find out, hey, what do we need to do here? How do you think the players feel? What has been your experience? Can you, you know, can you can you help? You know, like can we, we don't under we, we we're not in that we're not in those shoes, so we're going to lean on you to we need to lean on you to help and 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 really put these these things in perspective. And uh, what typically happens at that point is that uh, the black the minority coaches are in a in a crisis management one on one mode to help the program so it's a more of a behind the scenes diffuse uh, keep the train on the tracks and move on as quickly as you can or wait for the next news cycle to knock that event out and so um I think that's what and so, so, and and in saying that, what the voice that you that one voice that you hear from that from that uh, football program is a voice that does not necessarily reflect everything that's going on inside the program, but it may reflect uh, what may need to be done to uh, maybe uh, satisfy stakeholders or whatever. And so um, that's, you know, but that that one voice at this point in time is that has been totally thrown out the window. It, that's gone. You see coaches and players speaking up freely um, with with no regard to ramifications, backlash or roadkill. It is what it is. This is how I feel about it, which I think is a is a great thing. And um I think at this point, you know, uh, if you're absent as a leader, if you're absent from the conversation, if you're absent from the conversation and you're not actively a part of the of the real dialogue that's taking place right now, the dialogue where we're, where we're looking for solutions, if you're silent in this moment, um, that says more about you than any carefully crafted statement that you could put out. And so, in closing, I, I will say that I can't speak for other coaches. I, I'm I'm not a, a, an expert on political issues. I'm, and because I'm black, I'm actually not an expert on racial issues. But I am a leader. I am a coach. And based upon 20 years, 20 plus years of coaching experience, um, what I believe that we need right now is more communication, more education, and more resources. Coach Mel, thank you for that. Super helpful. Very pragmatic. We've got about 51 minutes or so left, and I want us to transition here. Those of you who are listening in, viewing in online, I want to remind you we have a Q&A feature, a chat feature. You can submit your questions, and Matt and Jason and the team at Athletic Director U are helping us to 
choose those questions that we want to submit to the panel. Before we go there, you know, I, I would be remiss that some of your, your comments and, and even Chris, some of your comments reminded me Sunday in church, we had an African-American speaker and, and he, he, he said something was like a, uh, you know, just a stomach punch for me in terms of the, my own incompetencies in listening. And, and Joe, in the spirit of vulnerability, I want to offer that he said that sometimes we aren't aware of what the PhDs have researched in terms of the five levels of communication. That first level is cliches. You know, we talk about sports facts. How's everybody doing? That second level of communication is we talk about opinions. The third level of communication is we talk about facts. Fourth level of communication is we talk about feelings. And the fifth level of communication, we talk about needs. And that speaker just spoke about sometimes we as white folks want to stop at the layer of facts. And we don't acknowledge that there's a group of people, Chris, as you were just mentioning, who are triggered by decades of imagery, who have feelings. And just as you were saying, Mel, there, there's a visceral reaction. And that part of how we can do a better job of listening to each other is understanding sometimes we're just, we're not communicating in the same mode. Uh, that part of what we need to do is acknowledge that even though I don't feel it, you might feel it. And as we were talking about the word empathy, I need to draw closer to you and understand your perspective because often where I sit defines where I stand. And I need to understand your position a little bit better. So in that first half, I just so appreciate the, the transparent and the rich conversation. And now I want to transition to some of the questions that have been submitted. So if you guys can take a deep breath and grab you a swig of water and get ready. Now the audience is going to put you on the spot. And the first question from the crowd comes from Ted Gumbart, the commissioner at the ASUN conference. So Keith, one of your your contemporaries. His question is pretty profound, so we need to get ready for this. He says, my question is, how does the older white male from a privileged background reach an authenticity with a sincere desire to push for change and not just talk about it? So how does someone who comes from, you know, old, older white community, maybe had a privileged background, how does that individual reach a level of authenticity and push for change and not just talk about it. So raise your hand or unmute and, okay, Sean, go for it. Just to start off, I, I think the, I, I get this a lot. Uh, and hey, um, being authentic starts, right? You gotta start there. And for you to, to say that and to disclose that and to understand that and have a consciousness of where you are is the first step. So bravo. Uh, the other one is beware of microaggressions. Okay. Be very aware of microaggressions. And I'll give you an example of one. Um, typically by trying to do the right thing, we do the wrong thing or we don't know the right thing to do. And that's kind of what your question is. And I think the, the deal here is that, you know, a typical response would be, well, I, I, I don't see race. I don't see color. I treat everyone the same. And then my response would be typically, well, you don't see me. You don't see my wife. You don't see my kids. You don't see who I am as an individual. So I think it's that microaggression is very, is, is a common thing that you will see throughout the majority. And I think that microaggression you, it's not intended, okay, I'm going to take that path. It's not intended to be marginal or to be uh, in a way where you're being destructive to one's identity, but it is. And it creates this strand of marginalization. And henceforth, it's okay. And it's almost being invisible. I'm invisible to you. So that part is so key if you can master that and start that process of, of understanding microaggressions. And I, and I don't want to go through a, a tutorial of that here. We don't have time for that. But I will tell you that the microaggressions of, I don't see race. I, 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 you know, I don't see that. I don't see color. I treat everybody the same. You don't see me. You don't, yeah. you're not conscious of those issues. So start there as a process and that will help you understand 
Uh, a great book on that is uh, I just read from uh, Robin D'Angelo, uh, White Fragility. And, uh, you know, I, it was great for me. It was a quick read. You know, I'm, I'm hemmed up in the, in the house. Me and wife are, are academics. <laughs> it was good to have that conversation, but it was a, it's a good read. And it, and, it, and it fleshes out a number of those concepts of microaggression. So that's my, my little additive to that, to that question, John. Yeah, so Chris or, or maybe Joe, what advice do you have to someone who is worried uh, about an upbringing as uh, being one of white privilege and they want to have an authentic platform, they want to communicate here, they want to lead action? What insights would you have for them? Well, I really appreciated Sean's answer. And I think China might have wanted to say something as well. I don't want to exclude. So I'll go quickly, China, and maybe turn it over to you and Joe. Okay. Um, well, first off, forgive yourself. Um, people see your heart. And, and I, I spent a lot of time in the South. I lived in Virginia, Alabama, North Carolina. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, bless your heart. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and, and there's nothing wrong. Bless your heart for, for trying. And, uh, and as, as uh, Sean was saying, acknowledging the vulnerability. Here's an interesting point, though, too. And it's really a tough one for white men to deal with is that even though we think empathy is important, you can't be empathetic. You can only be sympathetic. Mm. It's a difference. You, you, can't walk, you can't walk a mile in my shoes. You, know, you can't become a black man and deal with being um, at a hockey match where my team just beat West Point and I'm walking to see my team and a uh, guy stops me and says, where are you going? And I say, to see the team, who are you? I'm the president. You can't be the president. Mm. Now you're not the president. You can't be the president of this university. And this is not 1906. This was 2018, guys. This is a couple years ago. And every, and by the way, John, all, Joe, all the black people on here have 20 stories like this. So don't, don't get it to us at all. We could spend a whole nother two hours. Oh, let me tell you about that time. This is a har harmless one. So being open to the fact that it's okay for you not to have all the answers, for you not to be able to figure it all out, that you ultimately, no matter what you do, Malcolm X one time, he was in an airplane, I'll stop here and give a turn to China. And I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just trying to let people bring humility to this. Walking through an airport, I might have been in Michigan, uh, Coach, and a white, progressive little young lady walks up to him, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. X, Mr. X, I want to do something to make a difference in the movement. What, what, what can I do? He goes, nothing. She, he said, you can't do anything. Uh, because it's, it's too deeply rooted. Now, I'm not that pessimistic, but I'm just saying that humble yourself that you don't have, you're not going to have all the answers. It's, it's going to be messy and, and, and you're going to get knocked around a little bit and, and that's okay. Um, so, uh, China, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. Um, and chiming in on what you're saying, Dr. Howard and, and, and Sean, speaking about microaggressions, that just reverts back to the, um, the initial uh, steps that I, I spoke on about first acknowledging the issue, even if it's just a casual conversation to say, hey, there's something that's happening in the world that's making me feel uncomfortable. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Which that leads to that very second step is talking about your vulnerabilities, your uncomfortabilities and your lack, lack of knowledge and what is happening. You know, if, if uh, if anyone does want to have a, a, a very candid conversation about microaggressions, reach out to a professor at Columbia University by the name of Daryl Sue, who actually wrote a book on microaggressions and even talked a little bit about uh, situations where women of color are experiencing it at a higher rate uh, than many of the um, uh, ethnicities. Uh, we have to also take into consideration when we're thinking about a change. This is not a marathon. This, I mean, I'm sorry, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And this is not going to miraculously change overnight. And when we're thinking about the change cycle, the first thing that happens in regards to change is a fear of loss. Uh, loss of a, a white man's identity, loss of, you know, when there are discussions of 
you know, you're taking my jobs or you're taking my community. There's just so much loss happening. And um, that right there makes people feel uncomfortable to open up to receive new information. So that's the reason why it's so important to acknowledge I am nervous. I am nervous on so many levels, but I am open to um, receiving more education. But of course, naturally, people are going to have to compartmentalize to their own level of comfortability on what they want to receive and what they want to reject, i.e. Colin Kaepernick, you know, all of a sudden, miraculously, People are receiving information now, but unfortunately, it took a devastating loss for that information to be embraced. So just think about the change. The first step of uh, a, a change process is that fear of loss. So to, to answer the, um, the commissioner's question about getting involved and in, in how they can be able to have those conversations about their own privilege, show that level of vulnerability and then that can generate some more discussions. I know I'm going to give you the last word. We're getting a lot of questions in, so I want to keep moving if we could. The next question comes in, John, from a colleague of yours, uh, from Andrew Joanna there, uh, the assistant AD. And, and the, the question that Andrew is asking is anyone working or planning to work in alignment with either the, the city police or the campus police to build trust, increase transparency, and, and uh, that within the overall student body, anything being done to alleviate the anxieties or questions around policing. And Mel, I'm gonna go to you first, putting you on the spot because you talked about reaching out to the police within this last week and then anyone else can, can uh, chime in as well. But uh, talk about this question from Andrew about what, what we can do to step closer to the police, reduce the anxieties, increase the trust? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Last Monday, we had a, uh, we had a team meeting on Zoom and we invited uh, two uh, black uh, local uh, police officers to, uh, on the call. And uh, the first part of the call, uh, one of the objectives was I wanted to them to uh, give our players a refresher on how to survive a traffic stop. That was one. I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that because my kids are all over the country spread out with COVID. They weren't here and I fear for their safety. But the, the second part, uh, the, sec the other reason why, why, they, why they were there was to um, really explain their so they could express to our players and our staff how they felt about George Floyd. I wanted, I wanted them to tell our staff and our players how they individually felt about the George Floyd situation. I thought that really humanized it and, and, and really kind of uh, uh, put us on a relatively similar plane. Uh, and, they, and they did a great job of doing that. Um, and then I wanted them also to really give their perspective on um, on policing and how they became police officers and what was their motivation and where their hearts were and 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 the role in policing what type of toll it takes on their families and things like that and then we'll open it up for questions and at that point our players and our staff felt like they could ask those guys pretty much anything and we did that and we hashed that out it was over an hour or so it took it took so um that's really a, a that's really a starting point, and so there's things that that, that can be done, um, things that we've done in in the past, and we're going to continue to do and enhance these things. Um, you know, ride-alongs with with our players, with local law enforcement. Uh, you know, during training camp, having a law enforcement day where law enforcement is come, they come to practice, they come hang out with the team. Afterwards, you have a barbecue, you mingle. Think, you know, things like that, and then also have them come and speak uh, to the team and, 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 and bring as many officers as they can and, and so that they get to know our players and our staff our, our, and our players get to know them. And so maybe we can take down the anxiety level a little bit. We can 
uh, we can take down the fear. And then uh, hopefully um, as when I meet with them, because I'm planning on meeting with them, uh, the three local police chiefs, uh, MSU police, Lansing and East Lansing. And when I lay out some some questions that I have for them, um, you know, because we have communicated and we have opened up and we are looking, you know, to 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 partnership in, in a way when hopefully I can get some answers on, on those things. They can feel like they can talk to me and we can just be transparent. And if we agree, we we can we can agree to disagree. But I think the communication part of it and then educating our players and our staff about uh, policing and, and and their role and how they see it and what they and what their what oaths they, they have taken to to serve and protect and then you know also um, in surrounding the the, our, the police and our staff and our players with any resources that we need to help facilitate a stronger relationship you know that's what we're doing on our campus. I don't know if anyone else wants to contribute, Joe. I, I'm impressed that Mel was reinforcing a maxim that you offered in your comments. Did you notice he didn't hire a committee? He just reached out to two African-American police officers. And in that moment, he was empathetic and created a space where uh, China, as you were saying, we could see them, right? And we could understand their perspective. And so it wasn't a long and drawn out strategy. It wasn't, you know, we, uh, on to your point, we didn't bring in an outside consultant. He just kind of stepped forward, took his role as being a leader there, and he's just trying to bring two disparate points of view closer together. So, Andrew, I hope that's helpful. Anyone else have a comment there about how to reduce the anxieties and the tensions between uh, the police, China? Yeah, John, I wanted to just share with you, as I mentioned earlier, I worked in law enforcement before I got into athletics and I put, worked on the prevention side. So uh, the, the sheriff of Seminole County, Florida, Florida, the man who arrested George Zimmerman wow. was the man who hired me to wow. serve as the executive director of the police athletic league. And my responsibility was not only to uh, make sure that our deputy sheriffs were out in the community and being engaged uh, with uh, communities, especially those in low uh, income areas, but to also work with the seven municipalities in that area with the police chiefs and their law enforcement officers. What a lot of people do not uh, pay attention to is that there is a prevention division in many of these sheriff's offices and in, in, uh, uh, police uh, um, stations. Um, I, it's interesting how there's discussions about defunding um, police which, you know, the, it's being taken in so many different ways. But prevention is starting to be the it thing again for some odd reason. I have no idea why. It should have always been a focus. And so feel free to reach out to your law enforcement agencies and speak to those individuals in prevention, on the prevention side, community policing. And also one of the things that we did not have a conversation about, John, and I hope that uh, everyone can utilize the resources on the university side, is the chief diversity officers. We have to tap into them. They have the resources as well. And their job is to make sure to connect all of these university offices and departments and divisions uh, so we can have discussions like this. They shouldn't be segregated. Uh, they should be, uh, these uh, staff members should be a part of what is happening um, in the community as well as in the athletics department. And I'm really uh, pleased that even here at Wyoming, uh, we do have not only our gender equity, diversity and inclusion subcommittee that wraps up into our athletic planning committee, but we also have a, a council on diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, through the university side, and it's all connected. We're all talking the same language. So I just wanted to point out, it's really important for us to try to continue, just like how uh, Coach mentioned, establish those relationships with law enforcement. Joe? Um, i I just like to add one, uh, one uh, different kind of idea to already the great comments that have been 
provided. Um, I know a lot of people will have members of the law enforcement community come speak to their teams during the course of the year. Usually it's, you know, at the beginning of the year when you're trying to go through all the policies and procedures and the rules and the compliance and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we, we've actually found something that <laughs> it sounds uh, maybe a little ill time to say this, but um, we've had uh, members of the uh, local law enforcement, one of two of which actually include former members of our football team come and speak to um, all of our athletes, not just football. Um, one of them, Chris Howard knows really well, um, is a former defensive lineman, 6'6". Um, and when they came in, they talked about um, everything from their own training, uh, what, you know, what things they have to do when they're in a very difficult situation um, that, you know, that's, it's not to promote what people see on TV. And I'm not talking about social media. I'm just talking about how it can de be depicted in movies and television shows and so on and so forth. Uh, how some different uh, municipalities have tasers and some don't. And, and uh, you know, just really walked everybody through the kinds of training that police officers go through. And both of them were black. And both of them um, talked about the same kind of experiences that they might face because they faced them well before they got into law enforcement. Chris Howard knows one of them, Carl Pendleton, um, is actually a mentee of, of mine. I uh, tried to get him into intercollegiate athletics. He was a <laughs> graduate assistant for me. He, was a, he w w co taught with um, Chris Howard in the Honors yeah. College. Um, we had him working as a full time staff member, but he, had, he was a criminal justice major and he had this tug you know, to go into the field. So the, the last piece of this is what's actually been happening on a positive side mm -hmm. is we've seen more of our student athletes literally get interested in getting into law enforcement. It might be the FBI, it might be Secret Service, it might be um, any different level. But um, I think some of those conversations like Coach Tucker just mentioned um, actually start to turn, um, you know, different perspective in people's minds. Uh, now, these are conversations we've had for the last several years. You know, we Obviously, we'll have different ones when our student athletes come back to campus, but I just thought I'd just add a little different angle to it. Hey, Joe, um, thank you. I was looking around in my office. I have a book stop that, uh, a door stop that Carl gave me, and I'm trying to find, I think I got too much stuff in my office, but uh, you mentioned an interesting point. There's a feeling now that we're not going to have enough police officers in the future because of these turbulent times going on. My thesis is a little different, and that is that it's almost like post 9 11 when a lot of people, when our nation's security was challenged, men and women stepped up to serve and put themselves in dangerous positions. Pat Tillman, right, for example. We're going to have a, I don't want him to be a, he or she to be a martyr, but I, you're going to have people that are going to run toward this challenge with the right heart and the spirit, the Carl Pendleton's of the world, the Chris Davis's of the world I brought. The FBI agent I brought the spoke spoke for Coach Coach Stoops team a couple several years ago. They're going to want to be a part of the solution. Uh, so I, I just wanted to lift that up very quickly. Hey, uh, and, and John, you got to get uh, Keith Gill to speak. We hadn't heard from him in a while. He's, he's well, sleeping over there or something. I want to bring this next question to you. I I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Uh, so I want to bring this next question to you, Keith. This was this is uh, show some authenticity from the panel. So Coach uh, Christian Weber, who's the men's basketball assistant coach at Virginia Tech, he asked this question, and again, this very honest uh, submission from a panelist. He said, what can African-American assistants say or do to help steer white head coaches to understand how important it is for them to use their voice and their presence to evoke real change? So what can an African-American assistant say or do when you're working with a white head coach, for them to better understand how to use their platform, their voice, as a presence for change. So Keith, uh, share a little bit about your perspective. Um, you've worked on kind of all, 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 you know, all sides of the athletic business, including being a student athlete yourself. So what would you encourage 
someone who's an assistant to uh, to do as they work with a white head coach? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I think that's a great question. I, I think all of these things are challenging because the conversations can be very uncomfortable. And so the first thing you obviously have to acknowledge is that, you know, that white head coach has agency over the assistant coach. And, and so that means something, you know, and, um, and so I would say that, you know, obviously you've got to make sure that you have the right trust and understanding of what, in, what's in that individual heart, um, just to make sure that you are not putting yourself in a vulnerable position. And that's just real. I mean, I think we want everyone to run into the fire, but the reality is you've got to put food on the table and you've got a career to think about. And, you know, and, and, and those things come at all of us all the time, which is, you know, I mean, I, I think one thing we haven't talked a lot about here is the fact that for African-Americans, we're always kind of code switching and, and moving around out of different environments because of this kind of unfeeling, you can't be safe if you're authentic all the time. And, and we've certainly learned that from society. We've learned that from our parents. You know, I mean, my parents grew up in Jim Crow, South Carolina. And so that really influences my understanding about how to get along in the world and, and how to survive in terms of what they had to do in Chester, South Carolina. So I, I do want to acknowledge just the realness of making sure that you have, I'll say, situational awareness um, and that your boss is open for that conversation so that it doesn't lead to a whole set of challenges for you on an individual level. But assuming that that is there and, um, and that you have the comfort, I, I think being authentic is really important. But I, I do think it's really important to show people um, just how things work. And, um, and so when you have a conversation about is there or is there not systemic racism, make sure you've armed yourself with the questions to kind of explain, okay, well, can you answer this? Or when you're talking about, you know, for instance, the Confederate flag, you know, and, and, and you know, it's heritage, not hate on this side, and it's, you know, offensive on the other side. Well, you know, the reality is as a black man, the Confederate flag makes me very anxious. And, and I would say it's very inappropriate. And, and I would ask anyone to, to, to dispute this because I've not seen any place in history where you honor people who take up arms against your country. And, um, and so this is, and, and so we do that here. And so someone explains to me why that's appropriate, you know, and, and is, um, you know, are we going to have a statue to Kaiser Wilhelm um, because of what he tried to do in World War I? I don't think so. It doesn't work that way, you know, and there's no Cornwallis statue or King George statue. Um, you know, the reality is, you know, and so having that conversation in a real way um, that expresses your feelings. I mean, I think the hard things about these conversations are, you know, people get threatened and people get defensive by it. And so the, the more that you can do to kind of mitigate the defensiveness with having a cogent argument, having a fact based argument that is imbued with your feelings and real authenticity is, is really going to um, help that conversation and that education. Um, and my last point is the reality for all of us is there is a big gap in our education system that allows some of these things to persist. You know, the, you know, I, I would, I would argue that things just aren't taught the way, at least I understand the world. And I would say that I have a pretty fact-based view of it, whether it relates to how we talk about slavery, whether it relates to how we talk about lynchings and why policing the civil rights era, you know, the Tulsa race riots, you know, there's a whole list of things, redlining and kind of that's impact, how that has impacted the ability to accumulate wealth for African-Americans um, and, and what that really does to your ability to kind of get along in this country. And so I, I do think educating yourself in that space and, 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 and doing that is, is really helpful. And then like we've talked about before, having some real solutions for that coach in terms of whether it's facilitating conversations, taking some of the ideas that Coach Tucker had or Joe Castiglione had in terms of here are some things that we can do. One of the things we're doing in the Sun Belt, you know, obviously we're in the South. There's a lot of like civil rights opportunities in terms of education, monuments, um, you know, and so we're going to gather all those up now and, and we'll send them to all of our coaches just to say, look, if you're on the road and you've got some time, you know, the Dr. King Museum obviously is in um, Atlanta and, you know, Central High School is in Little Rock and they just opened up the um, 
National Museum, you know, or civil, the Civil Rights Museum in Montgomery. There, there are all these things, Rose Park Museum in Montgomery, that you can do. So I do think the education is key. I do think trying to deliver a kind of a way that's not defensive to, to allow people to um, really receive what you're saying and not be so defensive. And I think trying to give some concrete steps for some actions for those folks is really important. Because I do think the big question is, what do we do? You know, well, what are we going to do to change this? And um, and so if you can help them in that way, I think that, that that will be a good thing. Keith, I really respect that idea of making sure that the student athletes have opportunities when they're traveling for a game or competition to incorporate those stories, those moments, those monuments that can expand their thinking and point of view. And to your point in answering Christian's question there, that can have influence on the head coach because the the uh, the docent uh, or you know the the, the uh, person at that monument that's offering that perspective or that insight. I think that's a really practical idea. Anyone else have any uh, suggestions uh, for Coach Webster as it relates to thinking about that relationship between an African American assistant and a white head coach? What that African American assistant can do to encourage. Uh, the whitehead coach to have a more authentic platform. Joe? Well, um, I actually think that uh, having the coaches be empowered to lead internally. Um, and sometimes, you know, the, the leader, the head coach, feels like they have to uh, um, always be the one. And maybe your question points to the fact that they're expected to be the one. But uh, – We've gone to a little bit of a um, unique um, structure when we're having these conversations in safe spaces, and that that is um, doing away with titles, doing away with stature, doing away with who makes the most money in the department. Um, so if you think about King Arthur, everybody's sitting around the table and we're all equal. Um, and we don't... Uh, allow, I guess you could say, those that uh, have the, the higher stature in the department to always be the one leading those conversations. We empower our coaches. We're empowering, in some cases, we've empowered graduate assistants and students to actually be the moderator. Um, and of course, we're having to do this you know, virtually, not, not literally in a room yet. We would love that to happen soon, but we're doing this virtually. So you can use Zoom and you can do the breakout rooms and you come back and Talk about how 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 do we unpack what we've been through? Even as the last couple of weeks, I want to share one story that our coach, one of our coaches, I won't tell you the sport, shared with me, and um, he actually called to tell me this after one of those conversations, and he just said, "I thought you you would love to know this." And he said, "I don't call to complain. I don't call to anything, but just to let you know." that what you're doing to open the door of dialogue is meaningful. And we're not talking about just George Floyd or Armand Arbery or Rihanna Taylor. So we're talking about things that happen to us in today's world, like a month ago. And um, he talked to me about, he was back when the grocery stores opened up and his wife uh, asked him to go to the store and get some groceries. Um, he uh, he got out of his car uh, in the shopping center parking lot and was walking toward the um, to the door. And an elderly white lady um, was struggling lifting something very heavy into her car from a shopping cart. And he saw that and wanted to go over and provide her, you know, some assistance. And so as he started walking toward her, um, you know, she, he asked if, if he could help. And immediately she grabbed her purse. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I, I don't mean anything. I, I just saw that you were struggling and, um, I wanted to help you with lift that into your car. And right about this time, another person comes out from the store um, into the parking lot 
and sees this person, recognizes him, and said, Coach, how are you doing? It's so great to see you. Uh, gosh, I can't wait for – I'm not even going to tell you the sport. I can't wait for the season to start. Um, how's everybody doing? Are they all ready? I know they didn't get a chance to practice as much as they want, and we're, I hear you're going to get them back on campus. Man, I can't wait. to. Have, we have games. And, um, and when that woman heard this, she put her purse down and she said, you're a coach. And the coach told me, he said, you know, what, why did that matter? I was, I'm a black man. I was just trying to help. But now when you start, I, I, I thought Keith's point about you're changing roles, the, the code changed somewhere because now she could equate that he's a coach at the university, so he might be okay. And um, he, he just said, I'm not offended. I just know that there's a lot of work to do. And, and I, he said, it struck me because what, is, what are my kids going through? You know what, why I'm mature enough to handle it, but they don't understand. And, and he just said, I just thought I'd share that with you and um, really appreciate the fact that you have opened up these safe spaces so we can talk to each other to try to help each other work through. He said, because we're, we're struggling. And no. I, I just wanted you to know that I, I was in a conversation and not leading that with others, but he heard about it and he felt to call me. And I said, this is just early steps that we can do. It costs nothing. It, it, there's no talent involved in this. It's just the fact that you could show how much you care about the people that you, you can serve. Joe, um, Joe, Joe, I was going to piggyback with you. Joe, just thank you for sharing that story. And I just got. I just got to. I got. I got to reiterate again. All the black people you see on this call, and the ones you don't see, do that every day. We all have stories because what we have to do as black people, and I think this is what's coming post um, killing of George Floyd and what we've seen. Uh, uh, Mont Arbery, like you said, Breonna Taylor. And thank you, Joe, for saying their names. Thank you for that. But we have to play defense. We have to make white people feel safe all the time. We're, you don't have to clutch your purse. It's okay. I'm safe. I, I, and I think China mentioned the fragility, or maybe it was Sean mentioned the white fragility thing. I'm a safe black person. Don't feel threatened by me. Look at my posture. Look at what I'm wearing. Look at the way I enunciate my words. Because if I don't do that, then there's, I'm fearful that as a board, you might not think I get my strategy right as a donor. I might, you know, does that mean presidents have to answer to a lot of people as well? And so we 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 do this intuitively, and in this, and I will tell you, it's exhausting. I'm not a woman, but I hear that when you take your high heels off, your feet feel better. Black folk have been wearing high heels for 401 years, and it's exhausting. <laughs> Always having to be so careful. The old song, things that make you go, hmm, because then what happens? You get in this gray area, you're just not quite sure. Why am I being treated this way? So I was at a meeting, I'm on the board of the American Council on Education. We had a task force. I was sitting next to this very nice person for a very good public university in Florida. And she was going on about something. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Chris, I am such a big supporter of HBCUs. And, I, and she goes, and I just want to do whatever I can to support them as well. And I go, I support HBCUs as well. She goes, well, Robert Morris, out of, they're lucky to have you. And I, you know, I go, no, Robert Morris is out of an HBCU. And I say that a couple of times, y'all, because um, you, you see Keith, running a, a, a group of five, you see me, you see uh, folks that are not at HBCUs, but the presupposition is that you know, you've got to be at HBCU. My mom and dad went to Prairie View. I'm not, I'm not saying this. I love HBCUs and I am dedicated and committed. I used to do a lot of work at Langston when I was at Oklahoma. I'm just saying that if we have to be safe and we get put in the box, that's what we know about. What's happening behind closed doors is like says Hamilton would say with the room where it happens, or nowadays with a Zoom where it happens, that's the structural stuff we don't have a clue about. And we wonder why 
as Keith pointed out so beautifully, that we keep finding ourselves in vicious cycles rather than virtuous cycles. So it's just wanted to acknowledge the point for the audience that whether you be a president, an assistant coach or commissioner, uh, a senior woman's advisor, we are playing a, a whole nother game and, and always trying to make people comfortable. And it's it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard. So I have to chime in on this one because moving to Wyoming from New York City, I, I did it. I knew I wanted some some football in my life and I definitely wanted to work with a, a great leader and a great guy. And I had some candid conversations with my athletic director by saying, I am the first person of color on your senior staff. And I know that this uh, association that we have in this department, it has to be positive. It has to. Because if something goes wrong, there may not be a second woman of color or person of color on your senior staff. And so we, I have to be very, very mindful to be able to uh, stay within the culture. But one of the things that I do appreciate about my athletic director, he allows me to have my voice. And my voice is very important to me, especially in the diversity and inclusion space. So I definitely understand what you're saying, Dr. Howard. Michelle, well, I can weigh in. Chris, I can weigh in on, on that initial question, John. Range of your your playlist there between things that make mm -hmm. you go home and uh, quoting Hamilton. That's a pretty amazing eclectic playlist. But I need to get to another question. Mel, you, you were going to say something. I, I want you to, to be able to chime in on this. Yeah, I can. I can. Uh, you know, I spent 20, 20 plus years as, as an assistant. And, uh, you know, all before those years were with white head coaches. And so I can, you know, I can basically say, you know, how I handle the, those yeah. situations. And, and I think the first thing to understand is, is the head coach, is that white head coach, is he seeking you out for advice or are you going to him? You got to know that going in. I think that helps you understand the, the lay of the land. But I think it's important to, uh, when you talk to the coach, it, make sure you let the coach know that you have the pulse of the team. You, you understand what's going on. You And you have the pulse of the rest of the coaches on the staff you have a really good feel for the atmosphere and what's going on. And then uh, what I do is I let the coach know this is how this is being viewed. This is how you're being seen at the moment. Right, wrong, or indifferent, this is what is being said, which can help you understand, the, the, the put, it in, put it in the context. The other thing that I do is that I've, I've done is I – make sure that the coach understands how does that now with all that being said now how does that affect you individually as the head coach how does how does this affect you with uh your the relationships with your staff that you need how does that affect you and how you're perceived by your players in the locker room that need to play for you and how are you going to be affected and how does that how will you be viewed from a recruiting standpoint once you lay those things out, then, like Dr. Howard said, now we go back to the shared vision that we both have in creating some solutions and saying, hey, we want the same, we all want the same thing. So how here's some things I can do to help you. Here's some some things that that I'm recommending to you that you do right now immediately and 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 let the coach know I will stand with you. Could we have a shared vision? I will stand with you and help you through this, but make sure that the coach understands I will not lie for you and I won't cover for you. Those are two different things. And so it, my experience has been that I haven't always, um, the results haven't always been what maybe I wanted them to be, but at least that head coach was aware of where he stood in that moment, and 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 that was and that's a, that's part of my responsibility as a staff member is to help him 
and, and help them any way that I can. Mel, thank you for adding that in. We've got six minutes left, so we're going to move really quickly with this. It's, and it's a significant question, and that is, what do you anticipate are going to be the challenges of supporters, say, season ticket holders, donors, alumni, who don't agree with where you as an administrator or where the university stands or is headed? How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with uh, donors, season ticket holders, alumni, who don't agree with how you're pushing forward. So quickly, could I get a, a weigh in, Sean? Can you weigh in? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a, yeah. a quick one on that. It, it, that's a tough one because compromising standards will get you in trouble. Okay. All I have is my credibility and my core values. So the great news about NIU is that we're in lockstep. My president, Lisa Freeman, she's outstanding. She's my rock. Our institution. Uh, is founded and supportive of what we do. So if our donors or folks that are seeing it a different way, we, we need to do a better job in educating them. We need to take accountability on understanding why these things are so important. The great news, though, uh, is that NIU, our supporters, our alumni base, we get it. This is real. This is real life. And it's about us educating and continuing the line of, of communication about why this is so central to the mission, a vision, and goals and objectives of our institution. And that's very similar to a lot of us that share the same concerns. So that's my point. Keith, how are we going to deal with supporters, season ticket holders, donors, alumni? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing is, you know, everyone's against murder. And you can clearly see kind of what happened to George Floyd. Um, if you look at what happened to Christian Cooper in Central Park, you know, she was in the wrong. She was breaking the law. He asked her to leash her dog. She totally said, hey, look, you know, I'm going to call the cops and they're going to rough you up. And it totally was this window into society. So I, I, I do think that, you know, we're on the right side of history. I, I do think that we can have meaningful conversations that move us in the right direction. So I, I'll be honest, with you, I'm, I'm not concerned by it. I, I certainly know there are headwinds there. And I certainly know there could be challenges, but I think the majority is kind of in the space that most of the folks on this call are in. And I think the other ones we can have really good, meaningful dialogue with to help them bring along. It's an education process. We don't all start at the same spot. And, um, you know, we'll meet people where they are and, and, and help them to kind of think about this in the most constructive way. You've dealt with donors for a long time. How do you deal with donors who may disagree with your perspective on this or where the athletic department of the university is going? Well, you know, it's, uh, I think, first of all, it's transparency. You know, we're a university. Um, we're an extension of, of the, you know, the of public of Oklahoma. And we're a representation of, of the public of Oklahoma and beyond because we have students from all over the world. But I, I don't think we can just, they expect we're going to change it overnight, as was said earlier. And um, for us, uh, we have to model the change that we would like to see, to paraphrase a, an old quote that oftentimes gets uh, credited to Gandhi, but it, it gets used in different ways, I, I understand. But in our case, uh, I've already had some of that, that type of uh, response from our fans um, because I've I've not tried to be outspoken for the sake of being outspoken, but I've tried to represent what we are. Over my shoulder is uh, the word magic, and that's the acronym for our core values. Um, I won't go all through all of them, but the I in magic is inclusive. But if you look earlier in the acronym, there's an A, and that A is for accountable. And so if we're going to be true to the values that we espouse, we have to live them, we have to breathe them, we have to stand for them and show that we won't stand for anything but them. And so my, uh, you know, my uh, actions, you know, have probably gotten a lot of criticism. Um, I, I was part of a march last Saturday afternoon and I, I actually, uh, by, by request of our student athletes and, and our staff, they wanted me to do a, a video log. So I did. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, 
and since have expressed what I learned through that march. I didn't necessarily understand everything I heard, and there are probably a few things that I wouldn't necessarily agree with what I heard in the march because people were emotional and they were just saying, but we were there and we were supportive and they were there. And our student athletes stood up and they made passionate discussion possible. I was so proud of them and I wanted everybody to know how proud of them I was. And I got a lot, of, you know, because I was in a march, they, they lost the whole message. They thought I was in a protest and they thought, well, that's, you know, going to change the tenor of our athletic program. And I said, you know, I just speak to our values. And uh, if you want to be here supporting the University of Oklahoma, then you're supporting what we stand for. We don't just stand for it t today because it's part of the news cycle. We stand for it every day. And, um, and we have to be able to hold ourselves accountable going forward to be able to, you know, model the changes that we like to see. Joe, I'm going to reluctantly allow that to be the last word from the panel. I, I want to thank each of you. What a privilege and honor this has been at, here at our firm at Advent. Our purpose statement, and you saw it on the hashtag that's here to my left, our purpose statement is we want to create experiences that move people. That's what we want to be about. And what a privilege uh, to be asked by Matt and, and by Jason to facilitate this esteemed panel. The dialogue, the thoughts, the comments, the challenges, the authenticity that you all have provided, I think have moved our audience. And I really am grateful for that. So thanks to each of you.